Story seven of the House with the Mezzanine and Other Stories by Anton Chekhov. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story seven: My Life, the Story of a Provincial, Parts five and six. Part five. Radish was unpractical, and he was no business man. He undertook more work than he could do and when he came to payment he always lost his reckoning, and so was always out on the wrong side. He was a painter, a glazier, a paper-hanger, and would even take on tiling. And I remember how he used to run about for days, looking for tiles to make an insignificant profit. He was an excellent workman, and would sometimes earn ten roubles a day, and but for his desire to be a master and to call himself a contractor, he would probably have made quite a lot of money. He himself was paid by contract, and paid me and the others by the day, between seventy-five kopecks and a rouble per day. When the weather was hot and dry he did various outside jobs, chiefly painting roofs, not being used to it, my feet got hot, as though I were walking over a red-hot oven, and when I wore felt boots my feet swelled. But this was only at the beginning. Later on I got used to it, and everything went all right. I lived among the people, to whom work was obligatory and unavoidable, people who worked like dray-horses, and knew nothing of the moral value of labour, and never even used the word labour in their talk. Among them I also felt like a dray-horse, more and more imbued with the necessity and inevitability of what I was doing, and this made my life easier, and saved me from doubt. At first everything amused me, everything was new. It was like being born again. I could sleep on the ground and go barefoot, and found it exceedingly pleasant. I could stand in a crowd of simple folk, without embarrassing them, and when a cab-horse fell down in the street I used to run and help it up without being afraid of soiling my clothes. But best of all, I was living independently, and was not a burden on any one. The painting of roofs, especially when we mixed our own paint, was considered a very profitable business, and therefore even such good workmen as Radish did not shun this rough and tiresome work. In short trousers, showing his lean muscular legs, he used to prowl over the roof like a stork, and I used to hear him sigh wearily as he worked his brush. Woe, woe to us miserable sinners! He could walk as easily on a roof as on the ground. In spite of his looking so ill and pale and corpse-like, his agility was extraordinary. Like any young man, he would paint the cupola and the top of the church without scaffolding, using only ladders and a rope, and it was queer and strange when, standing there far above the ground, he would rise to his full height and cry to the world at large, Grubs eat grass, rust eats iron, lies devour the soul. Or, thinking of something, he would suddenly answer his own thought, Anything may happen, anything may happen. When I went home from work, all the people sitting outside their doors, the shop assistants, dogs, and their masters, used to shout after me and jeer spitefully, and at first it seemed monstrous and distressed me greatly. Little prophet, they used to shout, house painter, yellow ochre. And no one treated me so unmercifully as those who had only just risen above the people, and had quite recently had to work for their living. Once in the marketplace, as I passed the ironmongers, a can of water was spilled over me as if by accident, and once a stick was thrown at me. And once a fishmonger, a grey-haired old man, stood in my way and looked at me morosely and said, "'It isn't you I'm sorry for, you fool. It's your father.' And when my acquaintances met me, they got confused. Some regarded me as a queer fish and a fool, and they were sorry for me, and others did not know how to treat me, and it was difficult to understand them. Once, in the daytime, in one of the streets off Great Gentry Street, I met Anuita Blagovo. I was on my way to my work, and was carrying two long brushes and a pot of paint. When she recognized me, Anuita blushed. "'Please do not acknowledge me in the street,' she said nervously, sternly, in a trembling voice, without offering to shake hands with me, 
and tears suddenly gleamed in her eyes. "'If you must be like this, then so, so be it. But please avoid me in public.' I had left Great Gentry Street and was living in a suburb called Makarika, with my nurse Karpovna, a good-natured but gloomy old woman, who was always looking for evil, and was frightened by her dreams, and saw omens and ill in the bees and wasps which flew into her room, and in her opinion my having become a working man boded no good. "'You are lost,' she said mournfully, shaking her head. "'Lost!' With her in her little house lived her adopted son, Prokofy, a butcher, a huge clumsy fellow of about thirty with ginger hair and scrubby moustache. When he met me in the hall he would silently and respectfully make way for me, and when he was drunk he would salute me with his whole hand. In the evenings he used to have supper, and through the wooden partition I could hear him snorting and snuffling as he drank glass after glass. Mother, he would say in an undertone. Well, Karpovna would reply. She was passionately fond of him. What is it, my son? I'll do you a favor, mother. I'll feed you in your old age in this vale of tears, and when you die I'll bury you at my own expense. So I say, and so I'll do. I used to get up every day before sunrise and go to bed early. We painters ate heavily and slept soundly, and only during the night would we have any excitement. I never quarrelled with my comrades. All day long there was a ceaseless stream of abuse, cursing and hearty good wishes, as, for instance, that one's eyes should burst, or that one might be carried off by cholera. But all the same, among ourselves, we were very friendly. The men suspected me of being a religious crank, and used to laugh at me good-naturedly, saying that even my own father denounced me, and they used to say that they very seldom went to church, and that many of them had not been to confession for ten years, and they justified their laxness by saying that a decorator is among men like a jackdaw among birds. My mates respected me and regarded me with esteem. They evidently liked my not drinking or smoking and leading a quiet, steady life. They were only rather disagreeably surprised at my not stealing the oil or going with them to ask our employers for a drink. The stealing of the employer's oil and paint was a custom with house painters and was not regarded as theft, and it was remarkable that even so honest a man as Radish would always come away from work with some white lead and oil and even respectable old men, who had their own houses in Makarika, were not ashamed to ask for tips, and when the men, at the beginning or end of a job, made up to some vulgar fool and thanked him humbly for a few pence, I used to feel sick and sorry. With the customers they behaved like sly courtiers, and almost every day I was reminded of Shakespeare's Polonius. There will probably be rain, a customer would say, staring at the sky. Oh, it is sure to rain, the painters would agree. But the clouds aren't rain clouds. Perhaps it won't rain. Oh, no, sir, it won't rain. It won't rain, sure. Behind their backs they generally regarded the customers ironically, and when, for instance, they saw a gentleman sitting on his balcony with a newspaper, they would say, he reads newspapers, but he has nothing to eat. I never visited my people. When I returned from work I often found short disturbing notes from my sister about my father, how he was very absent-minded at dinner, and then slipped away and locked himself in his study and did not come out for a long time. Such news upset me. I could not sleep, and I would go sometimes at night and walk along Great Gentry Street by our house, and look up at the dark windows, and try to guess if all was well within. On Sundays my sister would come to see me, but by stealth, as though she came not to see me, but my nurse, and if she came into my room she would look pale, with her eyes red, and at once she would begin to weep. "'Father cannot bear it much longer,' she would say. 
if, as God forbid, something were to happen to him, it would be on your conscience all your life. It is awful, Misael. For mother's sake I implore you to mend your ways. My dear sister, I replied, how can I reform when I am convinced that I am acting according to my conscience? Do try to understand me. I know you are obeying your conscience, but it ought to be possible to do so without hurting anybody. Oh, saints above, the old woman would sigh behind the door, you are lost. There will be a misfortune, my dear, it is bound to come. End of Part 5 Part 6 On Sunday Dr. Blagovo came to see me unexpectedly. He was wearing a white summer uniform over a silk shirt and high glacé boots. "'I came to see you,' he began, gripping my hand in his hearty undergraduate fashion. "'I hear of you every day, and I have long intended to go and see you to have a heart-to-heart, -heart, as they say. Things are awfully boring in the town. There is not a living soul worth talking to. How hot it is, by Jove!' he went on, taking off his tunic and standing in his silk shirt. "'My dear fellow, let us have a talk.' I was feeling bored and longing for other society than that of the decorators. I was really glad to see him. "'To begin with,' he said, sitting on my bed, "'I sympathize with you heartily, and I have a profound respect for your present way of living.' In the town you are misunderstood, and there is nobody to understand you, because, as you know, it is full of Gogolian pig-faces. But I guessed what you were at the picnic. You are a noble soul, an honest, high-minded man. I respect you, and think it an honour to shake hands with you. To change your life so abruptly and suddenly as you did, you must have passed through a most trying spiritual process, and to go on with it now, to live scrupulously by your convictions, you must have to toil incessantly, both in mind and in heart. Now, please tell me, don't you think that if you spent all this force of will, intensity and power on something else, like trying to be a great scholar or an artist, that your life would be both wider and deeper, and altogether more productive. We talked, and when we came to speak of physical labor, I expressed this idea, that it was necessary that the strong should not enslave the weak, and that the minority should not be a parasite on the majority, always sucking up the finest sap i.e., it was necessary that all without exception, the strong and the weak, the rich and the poor, should share equally in the struggle for existence, every man for himself, and in that respect there was no better means of leveling than physical labor and compulsory service for all. "'You think, then,' said the doctor, "'that all, without exception, should be employed in physical labor?' "'Yes.' But don't you think that if everybody, including the best people, thinkers and men of science, were to take part in the struggle for existence, each man for himself, and took to breaking stones and painting roofs, it would be a serious menace to progress? Where is the danger? I asked. Progress consists in deeds of love, in the fulfillment of the moral law. If you enslave no one, and are a burden upon no one, what further progress do you want? But look here, said Blagovo, suddenly losing his temper and getting up. I say, if a snail in its shell is engaged in self-perfection, in obedience to the moral law, would you call that progress? But why? I was nettled. If you make your neighbors feed you, clothe you, carry you, defend you from your enemies, their life is built up on slavery, and that is not progress. My view is that that is the most real, and perhaps the only possible, the only progress necessary. The limits of universal progress, which is common to all men, are in infinity, and it seems to me strange to talk of a possible progress limited by our needs and temporal conceptions. If the limits of peoples are in infinity, as you say, then it means that its goal is indefinite, I said. 
Think of living without knowing definitely what for. Well, why not? Your not knowing is not so boring as your knowing. I am walking up a ladder which is called progress, civilization, culture. I go on and on, not knowing definitely where I am going to, but surely it is worth while living for the sake of the wonderful ladder alone. And you know exactly what you are living for, that some should not enslave others, that the artist and the man who mixes his colors for him should dine together. But that is the bourgeois, kitchen side of life, and isn't it disgusting only to live for that? If some insects devour others, devil take them, let them. We need not think of them, they will perish and rot, however you save them from slavery. We must think of that great cross which awaits all mankind in the distant future. Blagovo argued hotly with me, but it was noticeable that he was disturbed by some outside thought. Your sister is not coming, he said, consulting his watch. Yesterday she was at our house and said she was going to see you. You go on talking about slavery, slavery, he went on, but it is a special question, and all these questions are solved by mankind gradually. We began to talk of evolution. I said that every man decides the question of good and evil for himself, and does not wait for mankind to solve the question by virtue of gradual development. Besides, evolution is a stick with two ends. Side by side with the gradual development of humanitarian ideas, there is the gradual growth of ideas of a different kind. Serfdom is past, and capitalism is growing. And with ideas of liberation at their height, the majority, just as in the days of Beatty, feeds, clothes, and defends the minority, and is left hungry, naked, and defenseless. The state of things harmonizes beautifully with all your tendencies and movements, because the art of enslaving is also being gradually developed. We no longer flog our servants in the stables, but we give slavery more refined forms. At any rate, we are able to justify it in each separate case. Ideas remain ideas with us, but if we could, now, at the end of the nineteenth century, throw upon the working classes all our most unpleasant physiological functions, we should do so, and, of course, we should justify ourselves by saying that if the best people, thinkers and great scholars, had to waste their time on such functions, progress would be in serious jeopardy. Just then my sister entered. When she saw the doctor, she was flurried and excited, and at once began to say that it was time for her to go home to her father. "'Cleopatra Alexeyevna,' said Blagovo, earnestly, laying his hands on his heart, "'what will happen to your father if you spend half an hour with your brother and me?' He was a simple kind of man, and could communicate his cheerfulness to others. My sister thought for a minute and began to laugh, and suddenly got very happy, suddenly, unexpectedly, just as she did at the picnic. We went out into the fields and lay on the grass, and went on with our conversation, and looked at the town, where all the windows facing the west looked golden in the setting sun. After that Blagovo appeared every time my sister came to see me, and they always greeted each other as though their meeting was unexpected. My sister used to listen while the doctor and I argued, and her face was always joyful and rapturous, admiring and curious, and it seemed to me that a new world was slowly being discovered before her eyes, a world which she had not seen before, even in her dreams, which now she was trying to divine. When the doctor was not there, she was quiet and sad and if, as she sat on my bed, she sometimes wept, it was for reasons of which she did not speak. In August, Radish gave us orders to go to the railway. A couple of days before we were driven out of town, my father came to see me. He sat down, and without looking at me, slowly wiped his red face, then took out of his pocket our local paper, and read out with deliberate emphasis on each word that a schoolfellow of my own age, the son of the director of the State Bank, had been appointed chief clerk of the Court of the Exchequer. 
"'And now, look at yourself,' he said, folding up the newspaper. "'You are a beggar, a vagabond, a scoundrel. "'Even the bourgeoisie and other peasants get education "'to make themselves decent people, "'while you, a Poloniev, with famous noble ancestors, "'go wallowing in the mire. "'But I did not come here to talk to you. "'I have given you up already.' He went on in a choking voice as he stood up. "'I came here to find out where your sister is, you scoundrel. She left me after dinner. It is now past seven o'clock, and she is not in. She has been going out lately without telling me, and she has been disrespectful. And I see your filthy, abominable influence at work. Where is she?' He had in his hands the familiar umbrella, and I was already taken aback, and I stood stiff and erect like a schoolboy, waiting for my father to thrash me, but he saw the glance I cast at the umbrella, and this probably checked him. "'Live as you like,' he said. "'My blessing is gone from you.' "'Good God!' muttered my old nurse behind the door. "'You are lost.' Oh, my heart feels some misfortune is coming. I can feel it. I went to work on the railway. During the whole of August there was wind and rain. It was damp and cold. The corn had now been gathered in the fields, and on the big farms, where the reaping was done with machines, the wheat lay not in stacks, but in heaps and I remember how those melancholy heaps grew darker and darker every day, and the grain sprouted. It was hard work. The pouring rain spoiled everything that we succeeded in finishing. We were not allowed either to live or to sleep in the station buildings, and had to take shelter in dirty, damp, mud huts, where the Raleys had lived during the summer, and at night I could not sleep from the cold and the bugs crawling over my face and hands. And when we were working near the bridges, then the Raleys used to come out in a crowd to fight the painters, which they regarded as sport. They used to thrash us, steal our trousers, and to infuriate us and provoke us to fight. They used to spoil our work, as when they smeared the signal boxes with green paint. To add to all our miseries, Radish began to pay us very irregularly. All the painting on the line was given to one contractor, who subcontracted with another, and he again with Radish, stipulating for twenty per cent commission. The job itself was unprofitable. Then came the rains. Time was wasted. We did no work, and Radish had to pay his men every day. The starving painters nearly came to blows with him calling him a swindler, a bloodsucker, a Judas, and he, poor man, sighed and in despair raised his hands to the heavens and was continually going to Mrs. Cheprakov to borrow money. End of Part 6